The Grazadillo School of Business and Management at Pepperdine University proudly presents the Dean's Executive Leadership Series. This podcast invites top business practitioners and thought leaders to share their view on the real world of business. a pleasure to welcome you to Fox Studios uh, and we have just a really special program planned for you tonight. I want to make a few announcements and update you on a couple of things going on in the school before we get to the main event which will be very exciting for everyone that's here tonight. First, I would like to once again thank Farmers Insurance Group for sponsoring the Dean's Executive Leadership Series, which they have done for three years now. And we have Rakesh Mishra, Vice President of Product Research and Development, who's with us representing farmers. So thank you so much. We also have a helping uh, sponsor and host tonight, the Katsakos family, and you all may not know them. Christos Katsakos is an alum of ours, and he and his family are very close friends of the Giannopolises, and they ha are helping host tonight as well. And as part of that, they are sponsoring an internship for an entertainment student at Pepperdine this summer in honor of Jim Giannopoulos. So we're gonna call it the Jim Giannopoulos Internship. So. The Katsakases could not be here and they regret that, but uh, wanted to do that because of their close friendship and appreciation for Jim being here and doing this for us this evening. Uh, just a couple of uh, updates on some things going on in the school. We do have graduation on Saturday. How many people in the audience are graduating on Saturday? Are there any? I know there's a couple who should be home studying for finals probably <laughs> rather than being here. But it's such a great event, this is the right place to be. But we uh, are actually have an entertainment theme going this week because Ann Sweeney, who is co-chair of Disney Media Networks and president of D Disney ABC Television is our, um, uh, being recognized Saturday and will be our uh, speaker at graduation. So, uh, so you can hear more about the entertainment industry. Then it'll be a wonderful day on campus in Malibu. A couple of really uh, wonderful recognitions for our school in the last, uh, in, in recent weeks. Uh, we had a faculty member, uh, August Harjoto, who is one of our finance faculty members, fairly new to the school. He was recently recognized with the Moskowitz Prize for Socially Responsible Investing. And this is a, an award, a global award that recognizes outstanding quantitative research in the field of socially responsible investing. It is given by the Haas School at Berkeley. And so we're just really proud of Professor Harjoto and I think it really shows the quality of work our faculty are doing and Professor Harjoto is actually uh, as well if any of you have had him in class an amazing teacher in the classroom as well so we're just really proud of our faculty and he just really represents uh, the best in what we're doing and that combination of really quality research and excellence in the classroom as well. The other recognition recently that we're very, very proud of, we had a group of four of our students from our full-time MBA program travel to uh, Baylor University in Texas and participated in their ethics case competition. And I don't know if any of the students who were on that team are here tonight or not, but they won that competition. And we've won it two of the three years that the competition has uh, been running. And the, uh, some of the other schools that were there are Wake Forest, Notre Dame, Illinois, Iowa, Baylor, of course. So we're really proud of that group of students and, and the way they represented us there, and particularly uh, in an area of ethics that is so close to our hearts and so close to our mission at Pepperdine. Our next Dean's Executive Leadership Series will be after the first of the year. We have a little bit of a break until March 2nd when we will be in Orange County going south and we'll have John Coyne, President and CEO of Western Digital with us uh, in Irvine and then we will head to the north end of our uh, Southern California region to Malibu on March 11th with Leslie Margolin who is President and General Manager of Anthem Blue Cross of California. So put those on your calendar and be sure and join us uh, for those events after after the first of the year. But right now I want to get to the main event for our program and introduce to you uh, Jim Giannopoulos. He is the co-chairman and CEO of Fox Filmed Entertainment and he has acquired a wealth of knowledge about the media and entertainment industry during his early career as an attorney and since then he skillfully applied his expertise to become one of the most powerful people in Hollywood. In fact in 2007 one of the uh, trade publications named him and his co-chair Tom Rothman as the two most powerful people in Hollywood. Um, they run uh, one of the largest and most profitable studios um, 
in Hollywood, and he has more than 25 years of applied experience in the entertainment industry, over 15 years uh, being employed at Fox Entertainment in a variety of capacities. And he can certainly look back on a multitude of blockbuster movies, including Titanic, the Star Wars uh, trilogy, Slumdog Millionaire. Uh, my daughter, of course, loved uh, The Devil Wears Prada. Uh, so a, a wide array of movies in, in many genres, but very, very successful. And so it is really my pleasure to introduce to you tonight, Jim Giannopoulos. What a nice introduction. Thank you so much. Um, I thought I would uh, dazzle you with a bunch of charts and arrows, but I have an alternative. And um, I thought because uh, Pepperdine is on the cutting edge of, of business and education that you might, be on the, might enjoy being on the cutting edge of, of something that um, wood is very convenient to knock because we don't want to ever take any, leave anything to, too much to chance. But on December 18th, there's a little movie that we're going to release about 160 countries around the world. Um, some of this has been seen, but um, it is now at the stage. Uh, Jim Cameron turned over Avatar the other day on Monday, which was the end of a wonderful and long and great journey. Um, but I think it, it, it would be best for you to experience it and to show it to you and then use it as a, um, as a basis and as a... Uh, as a um, a starting point for, for questions and also for an analysis of the various aspects of the industry and the creative process that, uh, that it evinces. Because, um, you know, if a picture is worth a thousand words, you're about to see billions of words. And um, I, think, uh, I think you'll enjoy it. Um, just a little introduction to the film, and I think one of the things that, that characterizes it and makes it truly unique, um, I've known Jim a long time. Um, uh, actually, about 15 years, and uh, and uh, he had had developed this idea um, many many years ago. It was a um, it was a scriptment, I guess you would call it. It was an extended story of um, of um, what has now become Avatar. But the basis of the story was there. The idea is that there is a uh, a distant planet, a moon on a distant planet, on which there is. Uh, very valuable material, in particular, in this case, um, unobtainium, as he's called it. And, uh, and um, so uh, the Earth is mining this, um, this mineral up there. And um, in order to interact with the local native population, these aliens on this distant planet, they've developed an avatar program which allows them to create beings that in every respect are equivalent to the local. Uh, native alien population. And uh, the way that's done is that there is a, and a lot of this, and of course this is James Cameron, so everything is actually well thought out in, in, in pseudo-scientific, but actually with a basis in science. Um, the idea that is that there is a, uh, these beings are created out of human DNA mixed with the local um, native DNA, and a, and a being is created that is essentially, as I said, the equivalent of a, of a native um, being humanoid, and a neural link is created so that, as you'll see in a moment, the participant in the program is actually, the, the, the mental uh, consciousness of that person is projected into this body, and for all intents and purposes, it is that person. Um, the protagonist, uh, a young Australian actor, a brilliant young actor named Sam Worthington, uh, plays a Marine who had been... Um, badly hurt, badly injured, and is, um, is handicapped, lost the, the, um, the, the use of his legs, and um, is approached, as you'll see in the first scene, uh, by a group of, of uh, government uh, operatives who were involved in this Avatar program because his twin brother, uh, who was a PhD and involved in the program, was um, uh, tragically killed sh shortly before the film begins, and he was the only one now with the right DNA for this advanced being. So. He's chosen, taken to this planet, and the story begins. Um, the rest, I think, is, is pretty self-explanatory. He comes to understand this culture, interact in particular with a, a young woman, um, and in the end, um, becomes very concerned about the damage that's being done to this civilization and this culture and, and the nature of it, and um, 
and, and comes to resist it. And, and so, you know, there's a huge epic battle which we'll get a little taste of right at the end of the of these sequence of scenes. These are fully contained scenes, so this is not really designed. These are plucked out of the movie in various parts of the movie and designed to show you a couple of things. First, to tell you the story, introduce you to the characters and give you a sense of what the narrative is because it's a really powerful and very emotional at times story and it's also a great spectacle. It's also designed to give you some insight into the nature of the technical and technological achievement that, that Jim has created because apart from the fact that it is the most advanced form of 3D that, that's been done to date, um, the facial and performance capture that this film represents, for those of you who've seen films like Polar Express or Beowulf or films of that nature where there is an effort to create a, a human uh, face um, in, a, in a CG, in a computer-generated um, uh, process. Um, it's very, very difficult to do. And the reason for that is that, pretty fundamental, it's that as infants we imprint on our parents' faces. We live an entire life watching and observing how, people, how people's facial muscles move, how their eyes move, how they interact when they're speaking or when they're expressing themselves. And subconsciously, there's an understanding of what's real and when something's not quite right. And so one of the great advances that, that Jim was able to create, and one of the reasons that he said for many years, I'll make this movie when the technology is ready, is the ability to, to capture, in performance capture, these actors performing in the way that they are, conveying emotion, conveying nuance and meaning in their, in their facial expressions, and in effect, for all intents and purposes, being real people to, to the audience. Um, in terms of 3D, there's a poster I meant to show, should have showed you guys while we were there for a brief moment. There's a poster in um, my office um, for a movie called Buona Devil, uh, which Jim actually gave me for my birthday. And uh, it was made the same year I was born, and I'm not shy about it, it was 1952. That movie came out in 1952, was in 3D, the first 3D movie. And the technology for 3D has been around for a long time, but not this technology. One of the things I think audience is starting to understand is how different and how unique this 3D technology is from what we have seen in the past. Um, and it's different in a lot of ways. It's different because it is digital. It's different because it is much more precise, but it's also di different uh, because in contrast to the pre-existing 3D, which relied on blue and red. I think you probably all remember those little cardboard things that slid down your nose. Um, this is an, a polarized uh, system. And in particular with digital, what used to happen is you would have essentially two images, two projectors, um, uh, displaying the, the, the two images on the screen. Um, in essence, 3D, digital 3D now is because the precision of, of a digital projector is so great, film is 24 frames per second. That's how it runs through the little sprocket holes, runs through a projector. Digitally, what is essentially happening in the images you're seeing is the projector is told to display 48 images per second, but one a left eye and one a right eye. The glasses you wear allow your eye to see only one of those two images. And so it's a composite of those images in a way that's really an advanced form of it. Now, in terms of what 3D is, and you'll see it and experience it, I think, in a moment, Jim has been one of the big proponents, Cameron, of, of 3D cinema for some time now. And there's one very fundamental, you know, like many very bright people, he has this great way of speaking to, you know, normal idiots like me in a way that becomes very obvious. He said, well, we see in 3D. We experience the world around us in 3D. Why would we watch movies in 2D? It's like we see the world in color. So why would we, I mean, sometimes black and white has you know, a certain expressiveness and, and creatively people can use black and white and do great photography and great filmmaking, but we see the world in color. Why would we watch it in black and white? And so 
those are the, the fundamentals of what he's trying to capture and what he's not alone, he's just a little ahead of the pack um, in advancing the 3D technology and in particular um, in the form that you're about to see it. Um, in addition, the contrast with prior 3D technology in film is that it used to be the gimmick that kept a, a movie franchise alive a little longer past its sell-by date which was, you know, the monster comes, the return of the monster, and then the monster in 3D. And it was just trying to eke out that last, and the effect of the 3D was, ooh, the monster's thing reaches out. Well, you'll see a couple of brief instances, because Jim actually said, he said, you know, I'm, the whole beauty of 3D and the value of it is not to have things poke out at the audience. That's, that's, a, that's an old trick. He said, it's to take the audience and bring them into the world of the film. And so he said, you know, I'd put a couple of those, you know, reach out tricks just so they knew that I knew how to do it. He said, but I didn't waste a lot of time on that. This is about bringing you into the movie. So again, what you'll see is um, Jake and his recruitment into um, the Avatar program, his first encounter with his Avatar, the first link when he becomes and, and his consciousness is um, embodied now in this, in this new um, alien body form, um, a first encounter with one of the beasts. And by the way, one of the things that you should be aware of and keep in mind as you watch this film, there's this amazing, and you're just going to get a little peek at an incredible world that's been created, which is a very exaggerated, completely original, rainforest-like environment on this planet, but including things like mountains that hang upside down suspended in the air because they're magnetic or waterfalls which are a thousand feet high or or trees that are several thousand feet high and beasts that are completely original when we first started talking about this movie we went over to Jim's offices and and it was a it was like a situation room but it was a creative think tank on which the entire walls of the of the room and floor to ceiling were covered with images of flora and fauna, real world flora and fauna. So a lizard that's a very unique coloring or has a unique sort of um, um, head, um, uh, a skull uh, um, um, a structure, um, plants, flowers, you know, different animals, panthers, all of which were the inspiration for the artists who created what are completely original beings um, throughout this film. In addition, the, the um, flora, the environment, the rainforest environment is entirely, every blade of grass that you will see was made in a computer. Inspired by these images of real world, and there are many exotic plants from all over the world and so forth, inspired by the real natural world we live in, but completely created in a virtual manner in a computer. Um, Jim was originally, I think it was going to go to Honduras, and there was some talk about going to some of the um, jungle areas of, of, um, of Australia and, and to find these various habitats, and he, he realized that he would have to make so much, so many changes from what natural habitat was to what his vision was, and he said, you know, at a certain point, I said, the hell with it, I'll just build the whole thing, and that's what he did. So. Without going on anymore, I think it's time for you to get a little peek at Avatar, and then we can talk about that and anything else that uh, you want to talk about. Okay.